I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. One of the most moving, wonderful, encouraging concepts of him returning to get us that's in Scripture because he said so himself. And he even said, if it wasn't so, I would have told you. That makes it emphatic for me. Don't know about you, but it makes it emphatic for me. He's going to do that. But that one little phrase in there the, in that uh, uh, quote says, I go to prepare a place. I go to prepare. Well, various things may come into our mind. Well, what's unfinished? What has he started? How long has he been working on it? How much longer will it take to finish what's going to be prepared? Is it structure? Is it atmosphere? Is it ministry of spirit? What, what kind of preparation is there? If you go to a banquet, there's certain preparations, things that you provide and present and put in place for the success of the banquet. There's going to be a type of banquet, uh, marriage supper of the Lamb. There's something about that that's going to be prepared, and that's just one little thing. And, and, and the reason I'm saying all that is to simply say this. He says, I go to prepare. Jesus Christ is not sitting around in heaven looking at his cell phone, waiting until the Father says, go get the church. He's not doing that. He's busy preparing. He's involved. And something else that he's doing that we're familiar with and I very much appreciate, he says he makes intercession for the saints. He's praying, praying for the saints. How often, just pick out one person in this room, be it yourself or someone else, how often is Jesus praying for that individual? We can say all the time. We can say frequently. We can say once in a while. However it is that we might draw our conclusion, he's praying. He's praying. Now, how many people are on the planet? Well, we can simply say all of them. He's praying for all the believers. He's praying. He's praying. He's busy. He's preparing. He's busy praying. There's something that he's being accountable to. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Think about that. Some are tempted to say, I don't want to think about it. Here we have a passage that uh, it's a little crude. Uh, and the point is made very clear. And I'll start by saying this little portion of a verse in Romans chapter 14. It says, every one of us shall give account of himself. To God. Give an account is, is used in various ways. One way is to reckon or to compare or consider. Another way is to reason or find the reason or motivation or why. Take an account of why. But here in this passage in St. Matthew chapter 18, we're going to look at it, and it begins in verse 21. It says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him till seven times. Jesus said to him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. This is a powerful topic, very necessary a topic to get involved in and accomplish what it's uh, suggesting, but it's not necessarily what the message is about. Peter asked a very uh, pertinent question. Was there things about whomever that he needed to forgive? Apparently so. And then he tried to get out of responsibility by saying, I just have to forgive seven times, right, Lord? No, not seven, but 70 times seven. Well, we understand that's 490 times. Nobody in the right mind can uh, keep up with something like that. So what it actually means is any time and every time necessary, forgive. You know that's the truth? Any time and every time, forgive. That means you don't hold it against them anymore. You don't complain about it anymore. You don't bring it up anymore. You don't go on and on and on and on and on about it anymore. If you do, you haven't forgiven. Guess what? You're in a sad shape if you're choosing not to forgive whomever or whatever it is. You stand in question before the Almighty. That's not what the message is about, but a little. Is that okay with you all? Let's move along. <clears throat> Jesus said 70 times 7. Verse 23 says, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven like unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. Going to compare, going to consider, going to check up on how his employees are doing, so to speak. And when he had begun to reckon, consider, take an account, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. 
Now, to them back then, it was millions of dollars, big time. How in the world that ever come about, I'll never know. But this is a parable. It's just something to provide a truth to, to consider. 10,000 talents, a big amount of money. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him in, uh, to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had so that payment could be made. In other words, it was suggested, implied at least, sell you and your wife and your kids and everything you got to pay. See if you could try to pay me back. That's quite a bit to think about in itself. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will repay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. He don't have to pay it, at least so far. This is an extraordinary consideration of the, the, uh, the, the scope of what this is. Yes. Talking about forgiveness, obviously, but look at the scope of what was given to the servant, so to speak, all of this value, and the servant didn't repay, and the decision was initially sell him and his family and everything and see if you can somehow pay back. Well, it, wasn't, it didn't happen. He pleaded. He got favor from the Lord, and f out of nowhere, the Lord forgave him all of this debt, all of this valuable whatever it was, forgave him. Not going to hold it against him anymore. Have you considered that? Well, there wasn't no value in what I'm dealing with. You need to reconsider. That's not the message. Let's carry on. But it's part of it. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him, forgave him all his debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him hundred and hundred pence, which is just a few dollars. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat and said, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry. Pay attention where this story is going. They were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant. You want to hear what's pretty graphic? If we're not willing to forgive, you know what we are? A wicked servant. Pastor, go on. I don't want to think about this anymore. I want to wait a moment. If we're not willing to forgive and let it be, let it heal, let it develop into something beneficial, if you're not willing to do that, wicked art thou. Amen. Like it or not, I've told you the truth. It's represented right here. Okay, let's carry on. O oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desired me. Shouldest not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant? Fellow servant, fellow servant, fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. Well, that's going to take all his life plus everybody else's life to get that paid back. So likewise, here's the end of the parable. So likewise shall my heavenly Father, Jesus says, do also unto you if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. It's serious. I know it's difficult. It's challenging. Things linger in one way or the other. But we have, that, we have the opportunity and privilege to choose to forgive and not hold anything against anyone ever again because our Heavenly Father has forgiven us. But the point of this story is the Lord of the business or whatever was going on, he took a time, took a moment, and asked the servants to give an account. Speak up. Take inventory. What's going on? How's it happening? In the beginning, I said, the, the Lord has gone away to prepare. He's busy doing that. How far along? I don't know. With what he's doing and what, what he's preparing, I don't know. I can guess. We have an idea. Also, he's praying. He's diligent. He's praying uh, uh, continually for the church, for the body of Christ. There's a reason and purpose for that. I want him to keep praying. I want him to continue. I want him to be successful. I want him to achieve that goal. Okay. <clears throat> Matthew 
Matthew 12, 36 and 37, let's read it for you, and we're going to go to Romans. And Matthew 12, 36 and 37, it says, Every idle word that men shall speak. Now, it's not every word we speak, it's every idle word. What's the difference? Idle words don't achieve anything good. Doesn't promote what God desires. That's idle words. Think about it. Anything that comes out of your mouth that doesn't have any progress or achievement or acknowledgement about God's purpose and business, it's idle. Fill your mouth and your heart and your life with splendor of who God is. Fill your mouth with blessing as you convey and speak and communicate. Fill your life with your lights to be shining. Let your light so shine. Be involved in words that are not idle. If they're not going to help or be beneficial or promote God's purpose and plan, guess what? Don't open it. Amen. Don't open it. Yeah, we think a lot of things and things, suggestions. We think a lot of things, but until uh, you, we say something, it's not something too terrible to consider. It's something to, to consider. But once we speak those words, whatever they may be, we're going to take and be, uh, be accountable for them. Every idle word that men shall be, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. We're going to do that. <clears throat> Ask God to forgive you of any idle words that you speak in. If you, ever, if, you've ever, if you have never asked him to forgive you of idle words that you've spoken, start using that practice. I'm going to. I'm going to. This message is about your account. Your account. Several of us have a checking account. How do you handle that? Uh, some of you younger folks may not be terribly familiar about it. <laughs> but it's a little thing like this. It has pages in it. It has checks in it. It has a register that you keep account of what you've written. That's what a checking book is. A checking okay, checkbook is. And how you handle that, one-on-one <laughs> -on -one checkbook. Uh, you write out the check. You tear it out. And immediately, don't wait, but immediately you open up your register part and you put in the person's name or business name, whatever, and what the amount is, $20, $30, whatever, and the date and the number of the check. You're making an account for yourself. You're being your own accountant. So that in time that passes by a bit next week or the next day or next year or when the IRS comes knocking, you have an account to show. This is what's happened. This is what's going on. The Lord of the people, I want an account of the servants, what's been going on. What's happened? We have an account that's being kept of us by the things we're saying. We have, some of us, uh, a, a savings account. And if we're diligent about it, we're putting a little in every now and then. Uh, creating a balance for some beneficial purpose in the future. And on occasion, you'll get a statement or you'll call the bank or whatever the case may be, and you'll find out what's there. What's been going on? If you're privileged to have a, an interest that will accrue upon it, you want to see how that's accruing, see how it's going. You're not being a miser like some folks are. You're being accountable. You might even have us oh, that are on uh, seasoned ways. We might have a retirement account that we look at and check on. We might want to adjust it. We might want to uh, steer our goal in a little different way. We're checking up on it. How is your account are you checking up on it? Are you taking an account? Are you taking inventory? The things you do, the things you say, whether you're involved or whether you're involved or whether you're involved, take an account of yourself. You're the one responsible. Those of us that are around you in your life, we encourage, we motivate, we do various things that's for the good or for the worse. Sometimes it's for the worse. But you're the one, I'm the one making decisions concerning my account with God that's in heaven. How does your account look? Have you checked on it lately? For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Watch what you say. Amen. Uh, store up in heaven things that are heavenly and glorious by the words you say, the things that you comment about. Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. We're talking about your account today. Are you being accountable? You're letting it ride, and just whatever happens, happens. Amen. You can apply this truth in all kinds of areas of our life. Amen. <clears throat> Romans chapter 14, verse 11. For it is written, 
As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. Every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Let's be doing that on a regular basis now so that the account that we will give unto him as it's speaking here will be a positive one, beneficial one, a glorious one, something that's a sweet-smelling savor in the Lord's nostrils. Amen. Every one of us, at one point or the other, will bow, will confess, will acknowledge his grace. And that needs to be on record. You know that? From time to time, we need to say, I believe God Almighty is the creator of the earth and the universe. I believe Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, his beloved son who gave his life for me. Need to confess that on occasion so that stays established, so it's not forgotten, so somebody else's perception of who, who you are hasn't changed. Amen. Steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. We know that it's going to be profitable, profitable. it's going to be gracious, it's going to be powerful, and it's going to be good. Every tongue, every knee, every one of us shall give account of himself unto God. Turn now to, to Philemon, right before Hebrews. Philemon. There's an example in these two examples. I'm just going to look at Philemon. Philemon. Uh, there's another example that's similar to this where uh, the Good Samaritan, we call him, there was an individual that was beat up by thieves, laid half dead, and he stopped where the church folks and those who had opportunity to help him didn't help him. He stopped and uh, took him to an end, and they bound up his wounds, took care of him, paid the necessities, and told the innkeeper, when I come back, if there's not some, something else owed, uh, I'll, pay, I'll pay it, take care of it. Remember that? Good Samaritan. There's not too many of those on the planet today. They're out there. Let's participate in being in that, at least that notion to take the opportunity to do something that's helpful. Here in this little bitty letter called Philemon, Philemon Epistle to a Philemon, uh, Paul wrote to, and uh, Paul calls him his fellow servant or fellow soldier. He's a brother uh, that was in the ministry with him, and he gives a few compliments in verses 4, 5, and 6 down through there. And then starting in verse 8, uh, he talks a, a little more direct to Philemon. He says, we have uh, a common friend or brother whose name is Onesimus. And Onesimus had some problems in his past. But he, when he received the Lord and became a Christian, uh, things were forgiven. Things were taken care of. He happened to be a slave or a servant unto a Philemon. And uh, Onesimus got away. And uh, it was disturbing but in the meantime, uh, Paul ministered to him, and things got better and was healed and forgiven and so forth and so on. Anyway, uh, Paul wrote this letter to Philemon and uh, asked a particular request. And it has a little bitty interesting twist at the end of it. Let's just look at verses uh, 17. He says, If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him, meaning Onesimus, as myself. Paul is saying, If you consider me a partner, receive Onesimus also as myself. Notice how Paul is comparing the uh, uh, servant, the slave, the questionable one of, because of his past and maybe his behavior hadn't been the best since. But he calls him his brother. But I want you to treat him as you would treat him me, like me. Are we in the position to do that with somebody that needs a little help? needs a little consideration, and you're asking someone of your close friend that you're wanting consideration for this person as you would consider me. Are we in the position to do that? I'm talking about your account. What's on your account with these kinds of things? What's been written? What's been uh, recorded? I still keep up with at least one of our checkbooks pretty meticulously. Two of them, actually. Personal one and the one that's to the church. Keep up with it. I know what's going on. Rare is there a surprise. Do we have one or two others? I don't keep up with it as meticulously. I know what's going on, but not quite so meticulous. Each of us need to be pretty meticulous about the account that we're making every day. That's being recorded in heaven. 
And we need to position ourselves so that whatever is going on, that we can be a light, we can be an inspiration, we can be a help of something, some way. Whether it's forgiving, whether it's giving, or whatever it is that we have the potential and opportunity to do. Because with every decision, with every action, there's an account being made, being kept with that we're going to have to acknowledge one way or the other. And that'll happen in our future. Don't worry about that. What we need to be concerned about is right now, how that account's being built and what's in it and what's on it and so forth. He said, uh, if thou count me therefore a partner, receive me as myself. If he hath wronged thee, notice what Paul says, if Onesimus has wronged me or owes you anything, put that on my account. We're talking about a guy who had a little bit of a questionable background. He got away from his master. Paul met up with him. Things got better. Things are uh, favorable now. And Paul is offering something that's beneficial for, for Onesimus, an opportunity for uh, Philemon. He said, take care of him. And if anything is owed, put that on my account. Put it on my account. Are you willing to hand somebody? <laughs> Ooh, don't, don't step out that far, Dave. Are you willing to hand somebody that's a little questionable your credit card? I'm not asking you to. I'm not expecting you to, but I'm saying, are you willing if the circumstances provide opportunity? Well, credit card's kind of kind of out there. Yeah, it is. But if you have a $50 limit, it's no big deal. Paul says in Philippians 4, 17, he says, Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Paul is not trying to promote promote accolade, achievement, bells and whistles. He's not trying to promote that. He's trying to promote the body of Christ to be willing and in a position to, to help, to bless, to pray, to forgive, and do these things so that it would be to our account that's being kept, that we're going to give an account for. You remember the Lord in the beginning called so-and-so servant, give an account of what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. And then right at the end of that passage, it says, Jesus said, my heavenly Father will do the same thing for those who won't forgive. Well, why should that be so such a big thing? We don't realize where we were brought from, what we were forgiven from, or fought because of. We don't understand the detriment of hell damnation for eternity well enough. That's the scope of it. Almost finished. <clears throat> Jesus has paid a great debt for us. We owe our lives to him. How's your account doing? Amen. How's your forgiveness account? The words we speak, how's that account going along? Are there red marks? Are there favorable marks? How's our confession or worship account? How's our giving account? Amen. Praise the Lord. Isn't this marvelous? Absolutely marvelous. I appreciate the Word of God so very, very much. I was sharing with the class this morning. I think through the week, I pray through the week, I consider verses and songs and various things through the week to prepare for Sunday. And I said, sometimes I don't get any kind of inkling or inspiration till Sunday morning. That was one of them. Actually, last night. Finished up this morning. God is wonderful. He's faithful. He's kind. He's taking care. He's watching. He knows. Jesus is busy doing things. The angels are busy doing things. Things are ongoing with the body of Christ. Everyone's account is being established and promoted one direction or the other. And we're going to hear a trumpet. Brother Dean talked about it again this morning. We're going to hear a trumpet. Things are going to change big time. And we're going to be catapulted in a brand new life forever and ever. Let's be ready and willing to serve the Lord. Keep our account in a place that we know what's going on. Include mercy and forgiveness on a regular basis. Include asking God's wisdom and counsel on a regular basis. Let your light so shine on a regular basis. Amen.
Anyone need prayer today? You have a particular need you'd like the church to pray with you about? God is